Dr. Rod Page. What an amazing life. If you listen carefully, you'll at least have a glimpse of why I'm excited about having Dr. Page present to you today. The son of a school principal and librarian, Dr. Page. Now, this is going to be the longest introductory introduction in the history of man. I want you to notice three things. A school principal, a librarian that produces a doctor. Does that not speak to the power and the necessity of education? He rose from humble roots in segregated small town Mississippi all the way to the United States Department of Education. As secretary of that department, Page championed student achievement and employed best of breed solutions to raise standards of educational excellence. Dr. Page forged his reputation for seeking out and putting in place innovative approaches to systemic academic improvement when he was the dean of the College of Education at Texas Southern University. At TSU, he established the university's Center for Excellence in Urban Education. He has also been known to have a knack for inclusive leadership, first as a school board trustee and then as superintendent of the Houston Independent School District. Now, that school district was the seventh largest school district in all of the United States. He was appointed superintendent in 1994, and he was the first African American in the district's history to serve in that position. In 1999, Dr. Page was named one of two educators in the country by the Council of the Great City Schools. Two years later, Page was honored as the National Superintendent of the Year by the American Association of School Administrators. Following his time as Secretary of Education, Dr. Page served as a public policy fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. In 2006, he authored The War Against Hope and in 2010 published The Black-White Achievement Gap, Why Closing It is the Greatest Civil Rights Issue of Our Time. Dr. Page is the eldest of five siblings and has a son and a daughter. Dr. Page resides in Houston because he couldn't find a house in Charleston, South Carolina. <laughs> Not so funny. Anyways, with his wife, Stephanie Nellens Page. Please help me welcome Dr. Rod Page. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. So much. Thank Thank you. you. Thank you so much for that warm welcome, but he left out part of my history, and so I got to share that with you to begin with. I was also a football coach at uh, Jackson State, University of Cincinnati, and then again at Texas Southern. It was at Texas Southern when I, where I learned a little humility. We were playing Gremlin one game in the Astrodome at that time. We had the largest crowd, third largest crowd ever assembled in the Astrodome. I think the largest crowd was uh, Sandy Koufax pitching performance. And then that was a Billy Graham event. And next one was a, Jackson, was a Texas Southern University, Texas Southern University Gremlin football game. And this is the game where I learned humility. At the end of the game, the scoreboard had our scores on the wrong side of the scoreboard. You didn't get that. Eddie Robinson Gremlin team had the biggest score, we had the smallest one. So I felt really bad about that. I was a little dejected. And as I walked out of the stadium carelessly, I knocked a little old lady's purse on the floor. And so as a gentleman, I stooped down to help her pick up her purse, and she looked up at me and said, I said, excuse me, ma'am, no offense. She said, that's right, Sonny, and I didn't give a damn about your defense either. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope you got that one. Did you? <laughs> I'm not 
altogether certain that I deserve such a splendid introduction as the Senator shared for me. But I want to thank him for that. But not only that, I want to begin by thanking him for sponsoring this event. And I think we owe him a round of applause for this event. Let's give him some credit. <laughs> Senator, we thank you for your leadership of this event. And although I'm a citizen of the state of Texas, I got to tell you, as I was watching the election results, I can't tell you how happy I was when it was announced that you were the winner. God bless you, Senator. Thank you for your compassionate yet powerful leadership. Thank you, and I'll borrow a phrase from the KIPP schools and just say, plow on, plow on. Also, I want to thank the founders of this great organization, the American Federation for Children. And the founder and participating founder of the modern choice movement in the United States of America, the late John Walton. We should always keep him in mind. And also the work of the Alliance for School Choice and the Freedmen's Foundation. And for this organization, I'd like to thank its leadership and also the membership, the men and women who do the work and is the wind beneath the winds of this great organization. To you also, plow on. Fifty years ago, thousands marched across the Edmund Pettick Bridge in Selma, Alabama, in a determined effort, in a determined quest for freedom. A few days ago, over 2,500 school choice supporters marched through Montgomery, Alabama in a determined quest for another kind of freedom, the freedom of school choice. This march was led by two American heroes. First, that great warrior for children, the indomitable civil rights leader, Dr. Howard Fuller. And second, the American Federation for Children Heroic Combatant, who's present with us today, Kevin Chavis. Thank you, Kevin. In his great 1920 book, The Outline of History, H.G. Wells, the distinguished English author, here, historian, Futurist, essayist, teacher, and avid socialist advised that the world advised the world that human history is becoming more and more a race between education and catastrophe. Let's take a careful look at the current education situation and see how we're doing in that great race. Almost 32 years have passed since the current generation of school reform effort was ushered in by a publication of the alarmist call for action entitled A Nation at Risk. Even so, our public school system today is disastrously close to insolvency. In spite of 32 years following A Nation at Risk being brimming with well-intended school reform efforts, an alarming high and growing segment of the nation's population, especially minorities in our great cities, is falling short because of educational inadequacies. inadequacies. Although the years following the release of a nation at risk were replete with gargantuan offers, uh, efforts of skilled and well-meaning educational theorists and practitioners, student underachievement, primarily that of urban school children, still is with us unabated. Though school, through school opinion polls, newspaper editorials, talk shows, Americans shout that eroding confidence in the very concept of public education. Evidence abounds that the public views education, educators' attempt to improve the public school system and the public education of our children a little like Shakespeare's Macbeth, a tale told by an idiot full of sound and theory but signifying nothing. The disastrous performance of American school youth on the recent NAEP protests amplifies this condition. 
All of these alarming reports point to one salient fact. Present public school efforts notwithstanding, today's public schools are not equipped to address the serious and difficult problems associated with today's socialization and diversity in our schools. Present public school reform efforts in the main are failing to reach a growing segment of our population. Bottom line is that public school reform efforts thus far have failed and will continue to fail if we don't find an appropriate way to manage this crisis. The current failing of public school reforms cannot be attributed to lack of effort. During the middle and late 80s and all through the 90s, in the first half of the first decade of the 20s, school reform was dominated by education theorists, political leaders, researchers, a long list of other interested parties and agencies, governors, corporate America chimed in, the judicial branch took shots at it, the parade to reform American schools was indeed long. But despite all that effort, here we are now, with an education system that some describe as in crisis. Even Education Secretary Arne Duncan described it as educational stagnation. It's indisputable. How we are present at working is not working. And continuing as we are present at working seems clearly unwise. To be sure, there are some signs of progress, some glimmers of hope that things are getting better. But it's indisputable that American children are still lagging behind their European neighbors and their Asian neighbors. Furthermore, the gap between minority and non-minority students still exists. These signs of progress, these glimmers of hope, can only be described as random pockets of improvement. So how do you explain this lack of progress after all this effort? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> it's said that opinions are like backsides. Everybody has one. Well, I too have one. And I'd like to share mine with you, my opinion that is. <laughs> Since the publication of Na Nation at Risk, much education policy in state and federal setting has been heavily influenced or has, been, or has had its implementation sabotaged by forces that I describe as guardians of the status quo. These forces are well financed highly organized, and extremely motivated. So far, we have failed to match their intensity. They have three very clear strategic goals. More money, less accountability, and no competition. These three guiding principles of the guardians of the status quo underpin all their efforts. Those who are members of authentic school reform movements must understand these principles if they have any expectations of success of reforming American schools. So where do we go from here? Here's where my opinion comes in. What we need to reform American schools is a total restructuring of school operations. My suggestion? is to design our school operations around the principle of universal school choice. Completely remove the power of government to dictate where a child attends school and give that decision power to parents and children. Now, I've been asked why I support universal school choice, and I need to explain that. Last week, Roger Jones, a, jur a journalist from the Dallas Morning News, while preparing an article that ran in the Dallas Morning News paper yesterday, he asked me why I supported universal school choice. Now, this question had never been posed to me exactly because I just naturally, uh, naturally supported this, but now I had to frame a statement that was going to run in the Dallas Morning News, and because edu education school choice is going to be a subject highly discussed in the now sitting legislative session in Texas, I needed to make sure that I had this precise. So I gave some thought to it to figure out when did I come to this conclusion? Where did I get these thoughts from? And I resurrected my memory and found out where it was, and I'll share it with you. 
I support universal school choice for two reasons. The first reason is I believe chaining a child to a school that is not serving them well is a miscarriage of justice. This was brought to my, I came to this conclusion by my encounter with Howard Fuller. You guys ever heard of Howard Fuller? <laughs> Tell you about this. I was a superintendent of schools in Houston and at the Brookings Foundation I was making a presentation about school choice. I had just become superintendent of schools in Houston and I was working trying to improve the school operation in Houston and my reasoning for school choice then had to do with making schools work better. And so my presentation was all about making schools work better. And that came off as why I supported the universal school choice. And at the end of my presentation in the Q&A, there was a booming voice coming from the back of the room. And a tall black gentleman stood up. He said, that's not the reason. The reason is it ain't right. The reason is it's not fair. The reason is it's not justice. Well, I was almost intimidated by the size of that voice. But then I had a chance to think about it, and that's right. It is right. It is not right to chain a child to a school that's not, perform, not supporting them well. It is not right to have a child go to a school that is really crippling them. So that reason became embedded in my mind, and I worked through many years with that as the reason. But I want to bring us back to my original reason, which I think how it was right, but I think it's also right to look at this other reason. Let's look at the other reason. As superintendent of schools in Houston, I came to the opinion that reforming a major school district with 200,000 students with the largest employee base, one of the, the third largest employee base in, in, in Houston, Texas, 35,000 employees, a very complicated system. I came to the conclusion that the system could not work efficiently embedded in a monopolistic system. The system of monopoly did not serve this organization well. So I believe the school choice is a necessary condition for effective and efficient school operations. All of the talk now about reforming schools are going to go nowhere unless they are freed from this grip of the monopoly. All parties, teachers, parents, students, and the public at large would benefit from the innovations and creativity inspired by universal school choice. For example, a Texas policy article entitled Teachers Win, a case for school choice, pointed out that school choice's primarily effect, primary effect on teachers would be to increase teacher salary. Think about that. To increase teacher salary would be the basic impact of school choice. It'd be their primary effect on teachers. And they have the research to support this. It held that universal school choice would lead to an average rank raise in pay of $12,000 for the teachers in Houston. Think about the impact of raising teacher salaries. Think about the positive impact of paying teachers more. It would increase the demand for good teachers. It would stimulate greater interest in becoming a teacher for young people. It would direct more school funds to the classroom. It would enhance teacher quality. It would be a powerful force for school improvement. It would help solve many school problems. I need to share an example of my experience to show you where I came to that conclusion. During the early part of my superintendency, Houston went into an economic decline. It was due to the changes in the uh, oil market, because Houston was basically a petroleum 
economically based community. All prices go down, Houston economy goes down. And this time, we've diversified somewhat, but at that time, it was stark. On the southwest side of Houston, there was a big group of luxury apartments. These apartments were there for up and coming young people without children who were basically middle class and above. <clears throat> they were living a good life, driving their luxury automobiles, great jobs. But when the economy went down and stayed down for a long time, these jobs went away and there were no people to put in these, in these apartments. But the real estate people were not going to just close down apartments. They had to find a market for them. Guess where they found the market? Government-supported housing. So they moved government-supported people into these luxury apartments, thousands of them. Guess what happened to my schools because of this? Guess of the stark change that took place here? Now, all of a sudden, we got a whole di different population in these schools. And by the way, there are more children than we got schools in this area because these people who lived there before didn't have children. So my principals were doing their best to pack these kids into these limited schools. The fire department was issuing tickets to my principals for overcrowded schools. So we had to have a solution to this problem. After a lot of thought, we came up with a solution. I proposed it to the school board, and I didn't have any idea it was going to cause the problems that I had. I, supported, I, I, I proposed to the school board, said, we are a school that's certified by the Texas Education Agency. And they said, yes. Said, in this area where we are, there are four schools that are also accredited by the Texas Education Agency. They said, yes. Said, but those four schools are private schools. They're private schools. Now, here are our options. We can take these kids and bus them 17 miles across the city in drive time to put them in schools where they'll cease, adding 45 minutes to their time to get to school and 45 minutes to the time to get back. Or we can have these children go to these private schools. And we could take the funds that come to us from the Texas Education Agency and pay the private school people to teach these kids if the parents choose to do that. I don't have to explain to you what the newspapers did to me about that. <laughs> but you know what? We did it anyway. I convinced the school board we did it anyway. <clears throat> So what do we do? We solved a problem for many parents. We solved the problem for me because my biggest headaches came from the transportation system. 13,000 buses rolling every morning and every evening, delivering 56,000 children to and from school every day, and every day somebody ran into somebody. I got a major part of my bad press coming from transportation. I did not need to add uh, that transportation problem to my uh, list of problems. So then, this choice issue assisted me in solving problems. So it is not only an advantage for children, but it also makes available to the school operations itself choices that will make the school operations better. During this period of time, I came directly from Texas Southern University as a professor in education. I didn't come up through the traditional route to become a superintendent of a major school system. I, I didn't have all of the practices and, and experience that they had in operating schools. So I had to seek methods of making schools work better. I had a goal to make these schools work better. I resented the idea that a public school a large public school could not deliver educational services to children. I wanted to make a lie out of the people who thought that public school system couldn't work effectively. So 
my whole goal was directed towards how do I operate an organization that works better, costs less, taking care of the employees, and guarantees results for children. And so part of the study called for taking classes over at the, at the APQC, American Productivity and Quality Center, that taught Fortune 500 CEOs how to run CEOs. Reading books, get ideas from. Several reports that made sense. One was the Kettering Foundation, who had a little book called, Is There a Public for Public Schools? In reading that book, I determined there was no public for public schools because the public schools didn't create their publics. And I don't want to go into all that in detail, but creating a public for public schools made a big difference. The Rand Foundation report, High Schools of Character, pointed out to me to think that as I look around the company, country, you have to ask the question, why do these choice schools work? Why is it that in my school district, the, the specialized schools work? Why is it that the magnet schools are working so well? Why is it that schools of choice are working so well? I concluded it is because the people who work in those schools are there because of their choice. Students who were there in those schools were there because of their choice. The things that they were studying in their schools of the things that they chose to study. This situation of choice became more and more a, 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 a situation that I thought made perfect, perfect sense. And as I look around about forces that are driving changes in our society, there are two that you cannot escape from. One is technology. And the second one is choice. This is an idea whose time has come. We can continue to limp along as we're doing. If we really want to make meaningful progress, we have to embrace the, the power of technology and choice. In his 2000 book, The Next Deal, a guy named Charney, who is the author of the 2000 Democratic Party platform and senior speechwriter for Vice President Gore, put it best. He termed our current generation as the choice generation. He said that we are in the midst of a choice revolution. The principal driving force of the choice revolution is that all Americans should have the ability to make choices for themselves and their families. Choices like the privilege of how to save for their children. Choices like the privilege of how to prepare for your future. Choices like what school your children should attend, which is now reserved only to the wealthy. The time for choice has come. Today's new technology and globalization provides people with more and more choices in our daily lives. More individual power, more personalization, more customization based on their choice. And as they draw these expanded opportunities of choice for themselves, they will not long tolerate being presented with situations where there is no choice and where their children attend school. My parents had a choice of three TV networks when they wanted to watch TV. <laughs> Their children have hundreds of choices. They can devote our TV and watch their favorite program when they want to, not waiting when the program is put on. If they don't like Fox News, they can go to MSNBC. At lunch, they can choose between McDonald's, Wendy's, Whataburger, Jack in the Box, or Kentucky Fried Chicken. Even services like the post office, which was my father's only choice, has given away to FedEx, UPS, and DHL. This is the choice revolution. And as people enjoy more and more choices, the notion that they are being told how to live their lives, that they're having others make choice decisions for them, 
will, is becoming more and more repugnant to them. This is a time for choice. Choice defines our generation. In our fast-paced world, everywhere we turn, choices and decision-making power is thrust into our own hands. This generation will demand the right to choose, the right to carve their own way, the right to be an individual, the right to choose where their children are in school. Universal school choice will put real muscle in the school reform movement. So Howard Fuller was right. It's not right to chain a child to a school that's not serving them well. But the other part of the issue is school operations and school reform will not work embedded in a monopoly. Universal school choice is the answer to many of our problems. So I propose to this August body our school reformers and choice pioneers to tie to strategically tie school choice to school reform. Point out that for those people who want to reform schools should be our natural allies. Teachers should want school choice for many reasons. If not only the reason that they would be paid more, it would increase, it would increase the environment's movement towards giving them more power. It will make their situation work better. <clears throat> there are national candidates to join our army. Let's strategically recruit them and explain to them why this is a good idea. So two reasons why do I support university school choice? Using Fuller's term, it ain't right. Using my own term, schools can't work better embedded in a monopoly. So I'll close with a, quote from, with a quote from Cheney's book. Thus, it is only a matter of time. With ever-growing pressure from a rising school generation, government will come to realize that they will have to embrace the choice revolution. They have no choice. To use Humphrey Bogart's words, he might say, Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but soon. And in the words of that great vocalist and spiritual singer, Andrew Crouch, soon but very soon. <laughs> this world is simply moving too fast for guardians of the status quo to keep the doors closed to choice. God bless you, and God bless the United States of America. <laughs>